we welcome our five amazing speakers today? Motherhood. It means something to each and every one of us. For some, it's hectically gathering all your children and making them look perfect for Sunday mornings. For others, it may be wishing that your grown children are here to celebrate with you today. For some, we're anxiously awaiting the arrival of the little one that will give us the title of mama. For others, it may be a desire, a stage in life that we haven't achieved yet, but we long to be there. For me, honestly, that's the one I'm most familiar with. In my 20s, I was told that I probably could not get pregnant, and if I did, there would be many complications, and the baby probably wouldn't be able to go full term. So, I love children, and I made them my career and my ministry. I studied them, I understood them, I learned to speak their language, and often I speak that more than I speak grown up. So, to date, I have trained more than $15 to potty train, I have scaffold learning, fostered personalities, kissed boo-boos away, and told elaborate fairy tales to get them to do exactly what I need them to do, exactly when I need them to do it. But to our surprise, on December 22nd, 2020, I took a test that allowed me to graduate to motherhood. We quickly got our doctor's appointments, and to our surprise again, we were reassured that the conditions they felt were there before were not, or were not anymore, and we know a God that probably just took them away. So we thanked God, and we moved on with baby gender plans and baby shopping. But God knows our challenges, and for me, my challenge is having control. I must have it at all times. I must have a plan. I must know what the future looks like. And it is very difficult for me to relinquish that control. But sometimes God needs to use those struggles that we have to demonstrate his power. On April 15th, my husband and I sat in a doctor's office as we were told that our perfect little Jolie Caitlin would have myelomeningocele, which is a form of spina bifida. The worst, to be exact. We were told that she may not have cognitive functionings, she may not walk, she may not have much of a life, but we believed that God would take care of us. Even though I know that God will take care of us, I still struggled with that control. I went home, I visited Dr. Google, I researched, I grasped for every ounce of control that I could have. I wanted to know what my child's life would look like what my life would look like as a mom. I was confident with all the education that I've had centered around children, my experience, those 15 plus toddlers that I've potty trained that I was going to be a good mom and I knew how to do it. I spoke their language. But now, I don't know how to be a mom to a child like Jolie. And that was a struggle for me to lose that control. So in the sorrow and in the tears, I felt God's strength and his peace come over me. And I knew that it was time for me to give that control to God as if it was ever my ability to have it. That's the thing about our relationship with God, that often he allows us to believe we have control just so that we can act on giving it over to him and demonstrate our trust in him. Since April 15th, we have had lots of information. We've been flooded with support and encouragement. We've been told that there's no reason why they believe that Jolie will not have cognitive functioning, but she will probably most likely not walk. And to us, the sky's opened and every possibility is in her grasp because mobility we can deal with. And if she has her mind, she can set it to it and do whatever she desires. So today I want to tell the mother who's struggling to control the life around their blessing, just let it go. Put it in God's hands. Ultimately, he knows that child more than you even do. He created them. He put a dash of wildness, a speck of spunk, and a whole lot of attitude. And each one of those things that he instilled was intentional. 
And just like my soul keeps repeating that no matter what Jolie's life may look like, she will be perfect for the will that he has for her life. And she will be equipped with everything that she needs to do that will. Your child will too. So place your control into God's hands. As the mom of an intelligent, loving, emotionally unstable, car and truck obsessed three and a half year old boy, and a cuddly, happy, mommy addicted 11 month old boy, my daily life goes a little something like this. At the wee hour of 5 a.m., I awake to the sound of my babbling bundle of joy and I force myself out of bed. But moments later, as I cuddle him close to feed him in the calm of the early morning, I thank God for trusting me to be his mommy. At 6.30 a.m. on the dot, I hear my toddler proclaim from down the hall, Mommy, it's green light. And within a few moments, he appears, and his still drowsy eyes look up at me. And in his sweet, innocent little voice, he says, Mommy, get my yogurt. And so the demands begin. A little while later, after spending the majority of my morning wrestling my squishy 20-pound infant, I finally pry myself away from his clutches to spend some time with Josiah as he sits on the couch watching a grown man race Hot Wheels cars on YouTube. Mom of the year, I know. As I join him, he looks up at me with the biggest grin and says, Mommy, I'm going to be four, then five, then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He giggles as I frantically shake my head no. He counts all the way to 20 and then says, But don't worry, Mommy. When I'm a grown-up, I will still always be your best big buddy. Fast forward to lunchtime and you will find me fighting a losing battle as I instruct my energetic toddler to sit still, put your legs in front of you, stop playing with your fork, and please just eat your food, all while catching Oliver's cup before it hits the floor and dodging bits of partially chewed up chicken nuggets and peas. After about 30 minutes of this, Josiah finally finishes his first bite of hot dog, and the bribing begins. Josiah, if you will please just eat half of your hot dog, two bites of cheese, and one slice of watermelon, mommy will let you have any special treat you want. Don't judge me. You know you've done it too. I prematurely think to myself that lunchtime is winding down when Oliver's water goes down the wrong pipe, which leads to a coughing fit. I make the mistake of giving him attention, which begins the battle of the brothers, fake coughing at each other for the next five minutes. I can't help but smile to myself, though, as I look ahead to all of the fun they will have as they grow up together. Several hours later, just when I feel like I can't do it anymore, Daddy comes home from work to save the day. The time has finally come for my weary feet, aching back, and tired arms to hand over the baby so I can take a break to make dinner. However, as I stand over the stove browning the beef, my sweet, precious baby boy lets out a high-pitched squawk so loud that it may very well have shattered the eardrums of the poor little puppy down the street. He just wants his mommy. So I continue making dinner one-handed while I contort my body into an awkward position to make sure Ollie doesn't end up face planting into the pasta sauce I'm attempting to stir. Dinner is done, bellies are filled, and the kitchen has been cleaned. Oliver is fast asleep for the night, or at least the next 30 minutes anyway. And it's finally time for this mama to step away for some me time. When I do, I can still hear the sound of running feet and spontaneous giggles from a quickly growing little boy. And I am reminded that while my body is tired, my mommy heart knows that this time while he is young won't last long. As the day is winding down and bedtime approaches, the nightly battle begins. After family Bible time, Josiah inches his way towards his bedroom like a caterpillar on the hardwood floor. Finally, we reach his room where he cannonballs himself into his bed. Next, we ask him about his favorite thing we did that day. Sometimes, on the day when we took a lot of time to plan a really special day, he tells us his very favorite thing was watching Blippi on his tablet. Then other times, on a mundane Thursday, when I spent too much time on the chores and felt like I practically ignored my boys all day long, he says, my favorite thing was playing with mommy. After we finish our routine, say our prayers, and kiss him goodnight, I walk out of his room and down the hall to the sound of a yawn, and one last, I love you, mommy, And in that moment, I realize there is no better life than the one I've been given, the life of a mom. I am the mother of two boys. I also have a Josiah. My Josiah is 15 and Emerson is eight. You see, it wasn't too long ago that those days consist, that my days consisted of changing diapers, naps, and uncontrollable fits. 
But to be honest with you, some days currently consist of a few of those things, and they're not changing diapers or naps. You see, life is very different than what it used to be. As difficult as those toddler tantrums were, nothing, and I mean nothing, could prepare me for the countless nights sitting at the dinner table doing homework. Once fifth grade hit, I knew my limits. I then turned the homework over to John. You see, I'm so thankful God gave me a very, very intelligent husband. Currently, my days are spent discussing school, friends, the latest superhero movies, cars, and one of my most favorite topics, girls. And did I mention that one of the most commonly asked questions is, can so-and-so stay the night? And I know a lot of you noms know what I'm talking about. The craziest thing about having a teenager is just trying to wrap my head around the fact that in three short years, I will have an adult child. He will be released to this world, and I hope and pray that everything we have taught him will be enough to survive in these difficult times. All while I'm still trying to figure out why in the world I found a large empty tub of peanut butter underneath Emerson's bed. But he did tell a close friend it was there in case of an emergency. Each stage of motherhood comes with its own challenges. To every single mother in here, raising your children as best as you can, dealing with the tantrums all on your, all on your own, and working that full-time job, praying that God will supply your every need, I see you. Working mama, waking your children up at 6.30 every morning to run through the drive through of Tim Hortons just to keep them happy and to get them up that morning, and then coming home from work with mounds of laundry, hungry kids, and homework. Oh, the homework. I see you. Stay at home, mama. The never-ending questions all day long. The constant need for your attention, but only as soon as the phone rings. And the feeling of as soon as dad gets home, I'm locking myself in the car and I'm turning in for the night. I see you. And I can't forget the mama who lost her baby too soon. You never got to hold your little one. You will never understand. But God needed them more than you. I see you. You see, I have lived through each and every stage of motherhood that I just spoke of. And not one stage is easier than the next. I've heard it said, and I truly believe it, that the hardest stage of motherhood is a stage that you are currently in. So I want to tell each and every mother here today, you are beautiful, you are strong, and you are needed. Good morning. I no longer have children in my home, so I'm now a grandma, which is the best job ever. And your kids, it's, diff it's not um, go, go brush your teeth or anything like that anymore. It's different things. And my girls are now my best friends. And Spencer, well, he still doesn't listen. <laughs> Never. But um, if you're in our Monday night Bible study, we've been studying about Abraham and about being faithful and about being obedient and about being submissive. And um, when we, I was studying for this, I've read this story hundreds of times, but there is a scripture portion in this that has just burnt in my heart for about a month since we've been studying this. So we all know that God asked Abraham to sacrifice his chosen son, his promise, his blessing, his future. And we all, I don't know if he kind of had a conversation with God that said why, but we know that he obeyed without question. He obeyed, he had the fire, he had the wood, but no sacrifice. And as they were going up Mount Moriah, I'm sure Isaac was questioning his dad. He was an adult, mind you, not a child. Isaac was a young man. He could have overpowered Abraham because Abraham was old, really old. But he didn't. Because through Isaac's lifetime, he had seen every trial, every circumstance, every disappointment that Abraham had went through. And he remained faithful. So Isaac, knowing his father's walk with God, 
that he never faltered no matter what. He trusted what the Lord had said to Abraham. And he willingly laid down on that altar knowing he was about to be killed. But we know that God sent a ram in the thicket to save his life. Now, there's a lesson there. We've got to be faithful in everything, in every situation, because even though my kids are older, they're still looking to me. They'll call me on the phone. Mom, can you pray for my friend? Mom, we've got this situation. Can you pray? They trust my relationship with God, hopefully, that they still need me. And now Penelope needs me. I can't stop now. My prayer life needs to be even more. My walk with God needs to be stronger. And so now we come to the part of the scripture that I was wanting to read. We know that now God comes to him the second time. And I'm going to read. It's in Genesis 22. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring or your seed or your children as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And this is what has just burned with me. And your seed shall possess the gate of the enemies. There's going to be places that my children are going to get to that I'll never see. There's going to be territories that they're going to conquer that I can't conquer. There's going to be enemies at some gates that I'm not going to ever face. But if I remain faithful... And if I submit, submission means I'm going to obey what I don't understand. I'm going to obey what I can't see simply because God asks me. So Spencer, Annalee, Alex, Casey, Angela, I promise and I vow to be faithful and to to be obedient and to be submissive so that someday when you come to a gate, You're going to be able to possess it, and you're going to have the power within you to conquer every enemy that's going to come against you. I have come through all those stages, a couple more added to it probably, And, and I thank the Lord that I am a mother, mother of four And actually, I didn't mention this before, but 48 years ago, which would be May 13th at that day, it was was Mother's Day. May 13th, 48 years ago, this coming, I had my last son, my youngest son. And so Mother's Day is very special to me. And uh, I thank the Lord that he's great and he's kept us all these years. He's kept my, I have three sons right now that's in their 50s. So some of us in here, we have got to that stage where that we're not just mom, we're not just grandma, we're great-grandma. And Sister Balo told me she was great-great-grandma. And so we are still important. The, the, the traits that the Lord gave to mothers, all of you have that special gift in here uh, of a mother. The, the special is, was unconditional love. That's one of the things in compassion, patience, toughness. It takes toughness to be a mother. You know, when I had my fourth child, at that time, I said to myself, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. With the other three, it was like, you know, it's okay. But but, but when I had the fourth one, but you know, the Lord brought, brought us through us. And every one of you that's in my stage of life now, the Lord will bring you through it. We're older now. Some of us are gray headed. Some of us, um, can't get around as good, and and some of us, we don't have as much stamina, and our hair color has changed, our eyes and our ears are getting dimmer and everything, but the Lord is still there. The same things that he put in our heart, we still care for our children. We still have that same love for our children. And we, we want to help our children if we can, and so that's those same traits he put in these younger mothers, 
He put it in us. He put it in all of you, young la even you young ladies. I think the Lord, the greatest gift he's given is, is the traits that I said, and those are in every one of you because someday you may be a mother. And even if you aren't, you are a caregiver for others. The Lord made women to be caregivers. And one of the greatest things that you can give your children uh, in the Bible, in Timothy, uh, Paul was talking to Timothy, and he said, Timothy... He said, your grandmother lost. Your, she passed it down to her mother, her, his mother, which was Eunice. And she, he said, now this is in you. It was on feigned faith, which is sincere faith, faith in God. That's the greatest things that you can give to your, ch your children. You know, it's okay to give them cars and give them all these other things, that bicycles and everything. But... Give them the faith that when they get older, they have something to live with. They have something to die with. It's not just living, it's dying too. So anyway, I, the faith that we put in there, even when you get older, you know, we, you know I've, I have seen mothers, and they've been good mothers, that raised their children. Some of them raised their children, and they didn't have a husband that came to church with them. And they raised those children. They came to church every day every service that we had, they were there. And now it's like, you know, they've done that. They trusted the Lord. Now it's like, you know, Satan is working on them. Now some, some of them don't come to church. And, you know, you, your children still need to see. Your grandchildren see, still need to see you worshiping the Lord. I have a verse that uh, I wanted to be put up there. And then uh, John 19, 27. This is to let us know. This verse more or less lets me know that, God said he would never leave us nor forsake us. But this verse tells something special to the mothers. In John 19, 27, now I have the, I'm, as you see, I'm older, so I'm, I'm the traditional King James Version, so I'm not sure that might be a little different. Then saith he to the disciple, which was John, his beloved John, behold thy mother, and from that day forward, his, this, this disciple took him home to watch over her. Jesus was dying on the cross, and he looked out and he saw his mother. It lets us know how much love a son has for his mother, and daughters too, but I do think sons sometimes have, have a little more maybe. But I don't have any daughters, so I really don't know. But anyway, Jesus was dying, and he said, said to John, Behold your mother. And then he had also said the verse before that to the mother, to his mother Mary, behold your son. I think the Lord wanted us to, wanted us to know that we need our children, even that we need our children from to the time that we die. Our children need to take care of us too and to help us. We need to let our children be independent because they're grown up and have their own children now. But I think the Lord wants us to know that. From, what, from the time that we're the mother and the time that we got, leave this world, that somebody's there going to be there for us. We need our children. You know, as a, as a grandmother, sometimes we get a little cranky because I'm getting older and everything. But we, when those grandchildren come around and give us a hug, there's just nothing, yeah. nothing like it. And so I thank the Lord for, that I am a mother, and I thank the Lord for all of you mothers. The Lord will be there with you. Some of you got quite a few stages to keep going to, but the Lord will be there. He will never leave you, and somebody, your children will be there too. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Wow, that was amazing. Can we thank again our five speakers today? They just kind of walked us through the beautiful journey. And I think I look out on this congregation, and we could pass a microphone to each of you ladies, and you have a story, you have wisdom that you could share, and I encourage you, find a way to share that. Younger moms, reach out to those who have already successfully come through your mothering stage. Find wisdom, and I believe that's what the body of Christ is beautiful in doing. So I'm very, very thankful to hear from them today, and I love each, each and every one of you. I'm just gonna share a quick thought as we end today. And as Pastor Enzi said last week, that was my introduction, and here is my sermon. But the sermon is very, very short in comparison with the introduction. And I did just love that message last week, wrestling with pain. Wow. I have gone back to that this week. 
And I was honest with him, though, after that second service, I said, I don't know if I can hear about all those injuries again. I heard them at 9 a.m. I heard them at 11 a.m. Oh, I lived through them, actually, <laughs> all, all 10 years of them. But I, um, I then had to tell him, you know, Mother's Day is next Sunday. And if you want us to talk about pain, um, there might be some labor and delivery stories <laughs> that we could share. Talk about pain. Us moms know a little bit about pain. Um, so he, he said, well, there's a verse talking about that you could use. So our text today is not going to be Genesis 3.16. We will not leave discouraged, depressed, and in pain. But that verse, is that not true? I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, the Lord told Eve, after their disobedience. And in pain, you will give birth. Wow, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> okay, get that off the screen. That's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> Uh, but um, the Lord knew what we needed, and Eve um, helped us out there. So you all know we are moving on. Our actual text. So this is why I don't do this every week. You, you, you know, you know that one. <laughs> I asked him so many questions before doing this. I'm sure Pastor was like, I might as well just just do it. I might as well just preach. No, he was very gracious and showed me different things and answered questions. But. Uh, I am thankful for this opportunity, and thank you for letting us just have a special service. To the guys and the kids who are here, thank you for just being here as support. I believe that the Word of God applies to everybody, so I hope you take something away as well. But even if it's just a fresh appreciation for the women of our church, for the mom in your life, whatever it is, I pray that uh, today and just the next few moments before we leave that God's Word will speak to us. And our story today comes from Luke 10 verses 38 through 42. A familiar story. Uh, it's only in, listed once, and it's in the book of Luke. I had kind of hoped that it would be in multiple gospels so I could get more information, but in, in studying it deeper, it's just listed once. It's five short verses coming from Luke 10, talking about Mary and Martha. All the ladies said, oh, okay. We've heard this. We know there's a Mary versus Martha struggle within us, uh, within each of us. But I believe that this, the Lord wants to encourage us today. And this was so heavy on my heart the last uh, month or so that I, I said, okay, God, even if it's just for me, I'm going to study in, I'm going to apply it, I'm going to obey it, and we're going to share it today on Mother's Day. So here's our first text. As Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner that she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I work? I'm doing all the work. Tell her to come help me. And I know there's some ladies in here that have felt that way. Maybe it's even in your own home. You're doing everything. And they just keep asking, when is it ready? When is it ready? If you would help me, it would be ready quicker. But that's another story. So Martha is having very real feelings that us ladies have probably felt um, whenever we're overwhelmed or distracted. And as the Lord says, worried and upset. Verse 41, the Lord said, my dear Martha, or in the King James Version, he calls her name twice. Just kind of a sense of, of love and understanding. Martha Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details, but there is only one thing worth being concerned about, and Mary has discovered it. The last verse of the chapter, she has discovered this, and it will not be taken away from her. And then the chapter ends, and the story ends, and I kind of found myself wishing that there was some more explanation or a little bit of rebuttal from Martha, but Jesus... But Jesus, and there's not, but I do think that within each of us ladies, we understand that, that desire to spend more time with God, to be the mom that we want to be by investing in our spiritual life and doing those things that we know have to be the foundation. And yet we're pressured every morning when that alarm goes off, like Sister Brittany said, whether it's a baby alarm or an actual alarm, we're pressured with the things um, that make up our life. There's Mary, Martha, tendencies and traits in each of us. We wonder if we're choosing the one thing that really matters. You know, it's hard to be super spiritual when the dishes are overflowing out of the sink. No one has clean socks and homework, and you're trying to balance just about everything. Sometimes you slide into a Wednesday night service a few minutes late, or you come in on a Sunday morning absolutely exhausted, and your mind will tell you, why are you even here? Are you even getting anything out of this? Your kids are just going to need you the whole time. There's this struggle. 
Martha is the survival mode. It's getting the necessary accomplished. It's part of life. And we long for that Mary. We long to sit in his presence, but often it's the first thing to go whenever life happens. But I think there's some neat things that we can observe from Martha. And I wanna just kinda of take the pressure off of ladies here today who feel like, like you don't have the Mary aspect quite developed and that you're choosing and you're, you're, you're worried, like the Lord said, you're worried and upset about things. Let me just let you know, there was some good, good things that Martha did. Martha owned the home that Jesus was welcomed into. She had a spirit of hospitality. She had capacity to be able to welcome people into her home. I think there is value in that. Mary, yes, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus. I appreciate that. But Martha was up cooking, and I'm assuming that's because someone was hungry. People wanted to eat. Jesus never told her, stop cooking. Come sit at my feet, stop cooking. No, he was like, okay, let, let's do both here. <laughs> you keep cooking. It's important. We have to be active. In fact, this, this passage is preceded the same chapter by the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus tells his followers after asking them which of these really fulfilled um, my, my commandments, the one who stopped and helped the Good Samaritan, active faith, the one who was actually investing, stopping what they were doing and helping someone. So there is such beauty in that service. I also love that Martha knew where to go with her complaints. She didn't tell a friend. She didn't just sit there mumbling. She went straight to the source, didn't she, with boldness? Ladies, we can learn from that. God is not afraid of our complaints. He's not afraid of our struggles, our disappointments, our worries. She went straight to him. Jesus, this is unfair. Tell me what to do. And I love how, how he, he says her name at the end. It indicates that, that she was loved by him, his tenderness and his mercy, even in his correction. And I, I take such comfort in that because I know that God sees our feelings. He is touched by our struggles. The Bible says by our infirmities. He's not afraid of those complaints that we bring to him. And Martha's issues weren't that she was just working too much too often, but I think her issue, her problem came when she took her eyes off of her purpose, off of what she was doing, why she was doing what she was doing, her ministry, her serving. And she started to look around at others. We can get in trouble when we look at others, when we take our focus off what God has called us to do, our home, our kids, our family, and we start to look at what others' lives look like and what they're doing or not doing. So she lost sight of her gifting and her ministry. She must have been talented. She had the skills to be in there cooking and serving, but she, she saw someone that maybe was uh, having a, an easier route at life. They're just sitting listening. That looks a little bit more enjoyable. Maybe she wasn't getting the attention or the accolades or praise that she was desiring. Martha saw Mary doing something that looked maybe more fulfilling or rewarding. A question I asked myself, could I continue to serve in my calling, my life, my ministry, my marriage, my home, if it's never noticed, if it's never praised, if I never feel like I'm achieving every single dream that I have. Contentment, I think, is a, a neat word for us ladies to really study on. Our world today and social media, and there's great aspects to all of it, but if we're not careful, it just becomes highlight reels of everyone else's perfect life, right? They, they make it look good. Uh, I post the good pictures of my kids. You know, I, I don't post the 10 before where they're not looking or they have something on their shirt. No, we, we, we put out there our best. But often when we judge others or we see others, we just feel like we're falling short or inadequate. Comparison is a very real trap for all of us, and we can fall into it if we're not careful. It is exhausting to try to be someone else. Any of you who have ever tried to attain to something that just is not in your wheelhouse or your skill level, you know it is exhausting. We, we all have strengths and weaknesses. I'm not saying that you never, ever try to be merry and sit at his feet. No, but you find that perfect balance of what God has put into you, what he's equipped you with, and maybe what he is drawing you to be. And there is contentment that comes in that. And you have to fight for contentment. You have to listen for the voice of Jesus above the voice of this world that's telling you you're not enough, frustrations, uh, this world would try to tell us we need to be 
have nicer houses, we need to be thinner, we need to be uh, happier, our kids need to be smarter. There's a lot of unrealistic goals, but the voice of truth, God's voice is speaking so beautifully. He, he calls your name, maybe he calls it twice and tells you there are, there are things that are needed. I am here if you would choose to come and sit at my feet. We guard our influences, we guard the voices that we're listening to so our thoughts will be right. One of the most challenging yet empowering verses for us ladies when it comes to our thoughts is 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, where the word instructs us to cast down imaginations. Those are those thoughts that you all know, ladies, we can just run with. It starts little, you see something, and all of a sudden your mind has made a big thing out of it. Uh, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Martha went straight to Jesus. When she felt those feelings, when she knew something was wrong, she knew her mind, her spirit was not pure and she was not serving out of gratitude and love. She went straight to Jesus. And, and I'm encouraged by Martha's story because later we find that, that she, she had faith. Whenever her brother Lazarus, familiar story, he was sick and they sent for Jesus. Our brother is sick. Before Jesus made it, their brother had passed. And yet when she heard that Jesus was on his way, even though he had not made it, the Bible says in John 11, verse 21, that she ran to him. Martha ran to where Jesus was. And it tells us that Mary was still in the house. Now, she came later. She has a slower pace. That's wonderful. I need a slower pace. I haven't found that gear yet. But Martha went first, and she ran to Jesus. And her honesty was still beautiful. And yet her faith came right along behind it. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But the very next verse, verse 22, I know that even now, whatever you will ask of God, it will be done. And the verse that started this thought for me, and I believe for all of us ladies here at Christian Life Center, was found in John 11, 5, Jesus on his way. This is before he even met Martha. There is a short scripture, John 11, 5, that just, uh, it makes me smile. After reading the previous one where Martha may have got a little mixed up with her priorities, John 11, 5 says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister. He loves, he loves her too. And Lazarus, but he named Martha. And that just, uh, I don't know if I just needed it on a certain day when that came to me, but the love of God, uh, we sing about it. There's no lie that his love won't tear down. There's no wall he won't kick down to come after us. He knows our feelings, our thoughts. He is not afraid of them, but he loves us enough to not leave us there as well. And Jesus loved Martha. And I just believe that he wants us today here in this sanctuary, those who are watching online, to feel that love and to know as our gift is going to remind you, I pray that each of you have one or we'll take it home. Number one, Christian Life Center loves you. That's our awesome logo on this side. But when you sit down and drink whatever you drink, you know what I drink. The coffee will be the only thing ever in here. But when I sit here and when I look at these words, and, and God gave us these words. I was doing some planning with Sister Lanessa, and I just, I felt like these three phrases were so applicable for each of us, but also just reminders from God that you, number one, are loved. You're loved by this church. You are loved by your family. Those who are sitting on the pew next to you today, maybe those who are far away and could not be here, you are still loved. Number two, you are needed. That is a lie of the enemy that you would not be missed. Sister Kirk mentioned it. Your age does not matter. You are still needed. Every single one of you. Our church is not complete without your giftings and without your giftings and ministry in action, without you serving and, and being here. It's not just filling a spot on a pew, ladies. I promise it is life to someone who needed to see you walk in the door today. Someone who maybe knows your story and knows what your week looked like and knows every battle that you have fought, and I know a few of them here today, but you walked into the house of God and you are needed, you are a blessing to each of us. Number three, you are enough. Martha, just the way you are, with your struggles, with your desire to serve, and yet your, your uh, frustration with those who are serving in different areas, you are still enough, just the way you are. Not when you get it all together, moms. Not when you have the perfect children. 
Not when you overcome every aspect of your past. Not when you remodel the perfect home. Not when your calendar eases up and you can host people. Not when you learn to handle every challenge that life brings you with a perfect smile. Not when you've balanced Mary and Martha perfectly for every day. But right now, you are enough. Just the way you are. Whatever you brought into this sanctuary today. God sees, he knows, and he loves you. To every mom, every aunt, every grandmother, sister, daughter, every Sunday school teacher, every friend, every ministry team member, every influencer, every coach, every disciple maker here or watching online, whatever role you currently fill, you are needed, you are loved, and you are enough. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me just remind you, I know this sounds like something we teach our teenage girls, and I think it's important at that age as well, but we're all just kind of grown up little girls. We still need to be reminded. We are beautifully, fearfully made, and His strength is perfect in my weakness. Areas that I feel like I just can't figure out, God's okay with that. He loves me enough to gently call my name. Maybe He calls it twice, and He's helping us along. He's looking for a willing vessel today. He will receive the glory. He said in that miracle of Lazarus, He said, I'm, I'm glad that Lazarus is dead. Now don't stop reading there because you may not understand, but He tells His disciples because glory will come out of this. Sister Jenna mentioned it, God's glory will be revealed. I'm believing for women of faith at Christian Life Center, those in the building and those online today, to get a hold of just something that God put in your spirit today. One phrase, maybe it's just your cup. Maybe you're just going home getting a hold of your cup, but you are gonna recognize the love of God. You are gonna recognize the calling of God on your life in a new way. You're gonna recognize that you are needed in His kingdom. You're gonna recognize that those babies God gave you are perfect for you and you are perfect for them. You are the mom that God gave them. You're gonna recognize that you don't have to compare yourself. I know it's a natural instinct of ours, but I think we're gonna have the strength to stop that and to recognize, God, you made me beautifully capable. Yes, I will work on sitting at your feet more when I can, but I will also trust that you are not afraid of my questions. You are not afraid of my weaknesses and my failures. It doesn't matter if you're 18 or 88, you are loved, you are needed, and you are enough. Would you stand with me today? I'm gonna ask for our ladies to join us down front. All ladies, please come. We're just gonna pray a special prayer of blessing over you as we close this Mother's Day service. Thank you, Jesus. God's presence has been here from the very beginning in such a beautiful way. I'm thankful for what he's done and what he is going to continue to do. And this is just kind of a, I would call it like a selfish altar call. You can just pray for yourself. If you want to pray for someone next to you, that's fine. But a lot of times um, we, we end up praying for others. But right now I want to focus. Go ahead, come closer. We'll make room. I want you to focus on yourself. Whatever that means, just, just talk to God. Maybe, maybe say those words that feel uncomfortable. God, I feel inadequate in this area. God, I feel like I'm not enough in this area. And let him remind you that you are loved. Let him remind you that this word today is for you. We're gonna sing a song about Jehovah Jireh, the God who is our provider and the God who is more than enough. One of my favorite passages of scripture, very familiar, we read in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them who are called according to his purpose. We love that verse, we claim that verse, we believe that verse, but it's followed by another challenging promise that who he knew, that's you ladies, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of, of his son. So he made a plan for you, he knew you, he made a plan. Verse 30, moreover, those who he did predestinate, then he also called. So he's been drawing you every single step of your life. And whom he called, then he also justified or forgave and made a way for him for them to be glorified. That's still you, ladies. He's leading you through these steps. So verse 31 is where we're gonna end today and where I want you to just get a hold of whatever situation in your life needs this promise over it. Verse 31 says, so moreover, after all this, after we've heard about God knowing us, calling us, making a plan, forgiving us, and then glorifying us, equipping us for that plan, what are we gonna say to these things? What are we gonna say to discouragement, negativity, depression, challenges in life, children that have walked away from God, heartbreak and different, what are we gonna say to these things? Are we gonna give up? 
Are we going to drink coffee out of our awesome mug and remember that the God I serve is more than enough? And if he is for me and we know that he is, who can be against me? Who could be against us? Our God is more than enough. Go ahead and sing, team. Ladies, I want you to just close your eyes and just personalize this. You're already loved. I'm already chosen. You're already chosen by the King of Kings. I know who I am. I know what you've spoken. Thank you, Jesus. Help us to realize, God, fresh and anew. You have called us. You have loved us. You have equipped us, Jesus. Imagine. You're calling names here today, God. That is enough. Lord, I pray you'd wrap your arms around every lady in this altar today and in this house, God, as we welcome your presence.